the farther. Go ahead. I can, really, under, I can really understand the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and how how they are individually and. And I've learned and felt when I pray, I am praying to, it, it depends on who I'm talking to or whatnot, or what, what the conversation I'm having when I'm praying, that either I'm talking to the Father, or I'm talking to Jesus, or I'm talking to the Holy Spirit. And it's been fantastic. And I want to thank Craig for, for that and the, I mean, all that, the whole lesson. Um, it really lightened me or opened my eyes to that. that I mean, I understood that the Holy Spirit was there for us to, to to have and for him to teach us and help us and guide us and 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 that. But I really got to that, I think, into that different level, understanding when when I'm praying and talking in spirit that I'm talking to three individual people. And it would it's really made my uh, spiritual life and really, I really can feel the connection with the Lord. Awesome. That's awesome. Like I say, we're here to feed each other. We're here to edify one another. So that's why it's a great thing that different people come on and they take the floor and they allow the Holy Spirit to work through them because we have different perspectives. We have different histories. We have the Lord uses us all in different ways. So when you have different teachers, you'll learn new things. Come on, Craig. I think we should probably even have building off of what was just said um, a night that we could actually teach um, really the operation of each because they operate differently. And just through the operation, a lot of times I recognize who's dealing with me. So, you know, like one of the tidbits, when things come at me backwards, or the Lord, or I, when I start reading the Bible and he pulls me to a scripture and I'm like, oh, but I need to get that in context. So I go up to the one above and then I go up above again. And then I go up a bit and, and I've learned father's teaching me, but he walks me backwards through the scripture. He doesn't do it chronologically. He does it reversed. So when I start seeing things reversed, I start going, oh, a father's teaching me now. You know, it, but we could really expand into how father works, how, you know, so we recognize their operation with us. Uh, this was all I was, uh, I'm just formulating my thoughts and should have probably gathered my words, but I think you get it. Yep, I definitely do. And I got that jotted down for the notes to discuss the different operations of the Trinity. And that's a that's a good a good subject because what we're about to dive into is a spiritual realm coming twenty twenty four because through this transition of seeing hearing in the spirit walking in our spirit man there's several things that we have to realize in the going into that season so I think that right along into the whole scenario of the spirit realm of um I want to talk about I mentioned to Sean, this, describing and explaining God's house, Descri describing and explaining how Satan and his whole world is set up. You know what I'm saying? There's so many different avenues that we can talk about to get better understanding of the scripture that we read every day. So um, on the gifts, we can go back to Isaiah. Sean covered that. Uh, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. Romans. Prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, ruling, and mercy. You know, and it goes on. So I think the biggest thing that we had I, in my notes was the tongues, which is we're going to bring a session just over the gift of tongues. The biggest thing that I've seen out of the session that was taught was people telling people that evidence was speaking in tongues that you had the Holy Spirit. And there was a lot, several people that disagreed with that. So we did some digging, and I think we're all in agreement that is one of the gifts. So the next session was taught by Diane, and it was the fruits of the Spirit. So in the fruits, we know it's uh, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, and it's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
And as an overview on that session, I think we came to more of a self-evaluation of every day that we get up, that we want to look at the, the fruit of the spirit and look at see if we're gonna if we're portraying those things on a day-to-day -day basis. Because that's that's evidence of the Holy Spirit. If you're producing the fruit, to me, I'm not the smartest man on the planet, but that's the evidence. Because beforehand, I think in Galatians 20, 19, 18, one of those scriptures, it tells you the fruit of the flesh. And it talks about the negative thing. And I want to definitely dig into that in the Antichrist spirit. Because while the Holy Spirit is here, we have to also re realize that the Antichrist spirit is also here. There ain't no shade of gray when it comes to spirituality. There's a yes and no that we can have through free will. But when you're talking about on that spiritual side, we got the Antichrist and we got that Holy Spirit, which is I call it a Holy Ghost. So that is definitely something else that we're going to dive into in 2024. Our next. See, she's supposed to be helping me and she got me all messed up. <laughs> The next was the promise. Andrew and Rebecca taught the promise. I think they're on it. Andrew, would you like to give us a quick overview of the promise? Rebecca's there. She's, I she's good. Caught him off yeah. guard. <laughs> okay, um, come on, come on with it, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. So, um, pretty much the the promise. Just to recap it, we uh, we revisited back on the identity, the original identity that the Lord had gave us. Um, and how from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how it we entered into a fallen state of man, which is, you know, I'm not who God says I am. It's that fallen state where I'm not good enough. And through that, through that fallen state, God gave Adam and Eve that promise through the uh, revealing to Eve about the snake, that the seed, that uh, the, the her seed will, you know, crush his head and he will bruise his heel. And that promise was Jesus and how Jesus came through and uh, gave us the Holy Spirit. And now we have him living inside of us. And through him, we are able to access the righteousness of, of Christ. So meaning he credited us his righteousness. So now we are able to think like Christ. We're able to function through Christ because of what he's done for us. So it, it relieved and it freed the fallen state of man. The mentality we're able to escape that mentality and actually see our original our original creation who we were created to be and everything that we have access to now in christ as you know as an heir that we were seated next to him um it's, it's like pretty much all the promises that come with um having christ living in us so that's pretty much what the what the study was about Y'all did an excellent job. I learned some things out of that also. If you really look at it, how y'all brought it to the table as a promise being Christ, my mind went to like, okay, how's this? And I'm listening. And how y'all broke it down to the fall of man. And from the fall of man, enter Christ, making his way to the cross to redeem us. Man, that was, I, it just blew my mind. The light bulb come on and so many other things make so much sense because I never thought about it in that avenue. So y'all did a great job. And this is why I love when other people teach. They bring a different side of things. You know, going back to the religion and tradition, I hate to harp on that, but um, I'll say for me, for instance, I come from Baptist and we went from Baptist to Pentecostal and from Pentecostal to a community church, non-denomination. So I've been way over there <laughs> <laughs> way over there and now i'm here because there was a huge difference between the baptist church and the pentecostal church and being a young man i really didn't understand what was going on you know i had to grow into the differences and then once i got matured in the flesh i started doing my own reasoning and then the uh, lord allowed maturing in my spirit to get where i was properly seated so living through that spirit i understood that some things were right and some things were wrong. And we discussed that in the tradition and religion. And to get back to the point that I was trying to make, there's a lot of things that I learned in the younger age that when I become a man and I start reading and researching myself, it were they were not true. They were not true. Amen. Based on what the word says. 
So, you know, it's just everything has flown so good together. And, and just like I said, when Rebecca mentioned that, it took me way back to 15 years old when I heard a preacher say this because I didn't read my own word. I listened to the preacher and I thought that's what you, you were supposed to do. You're supposed to listen and then check. Go read for yourself. Yep. So when she mentioned that, basically from the crunching of the apple, Jesus started making his way to the cross. Man, the light bulb came on. And I was like, I am so sorry. You know, just to, and I just <laughs> wanted, uh, I also wanted to mention that, you know, the, the really the main struggle that humanity faces, even till this day, even believers sometimes, is really just understanding who they are in Christ. That is, it's, it's the constant battle of, Either we agree with God who we are or we don't agree with him who we are. Or, you know, sometimes we we go back into that fallen state. I need to work for my righteousness. I need to do this to be righteous. I need to do that to be righteous. And they don't understand that good works is not a way to be righteous, but good works birth is out through knowing that you are righteous in Christ. So there's a difference between doing good works to feel righteous versus allowing good works good works to birth out of you because you know that you are already righteous. So that is like the constant struggle between the fallen state and the new, and the renewed mind is literally those two things. They're, they are always working against each other. And the Bible calls the fallen state, of course, flesh, carnal mind, which is the same thing as the fallen state of mind. The fallen state always feels like it has to do something to earn something. They, there has to be some, the way they find value in their life is by achieving something, doing something or or being something that gives you some type of credit for you to deserve what, who you are. And it's, that's just a, a way of that's pretty much self work. That's like work of self. And that is the constant mentality that a lot of believers keep going back because that's the carnal mind. The carnal mind thinks that way. It's not always it's not always. Um, which through that self-effort births out also sinful behavior. You know what I'm saying? Like sexual lust and all those things will grow out of that because anytime that you go to self-life working for to try to achieve those things, uh, sinful life grows out of that. And that's really where the constant struggle is at. And I have discovered that <laughs> literally through, is literally what it is, is, wow, this is who I really am in Christ. I am righteous already. I am seated with him. You know, I, I have all this value in me already. I'm just trying to understand who I am. And that's really the, if you, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like the pinpoint of the whole Christian walk is really knowing who you are. And that's why as we grow in Christ, we understand the more we know Christ, the more we realize who we are in him. And that is the key to the whole, pretty much walking this whole walk. But yeah, so. Amen. Amen. You keep continue talking if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just really passionate. I am you always so passionate bring a good about word. this part of the topic because I'm telling you, this is where it all goes. This is the root of every issue that comes out, every struggle that comes out in our spiritual life is based on literally that. We have moments where we just move out of that will and we just start attaining things like looking after things wanting to 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 do things and and we move away from the only one thing i'm just gonna say that like i'm gonna, with so much confidence because i know without a doubt in my heart and my spirit that god truly wants you to just focus on seeking him and leaving the rest to him to bring to your life which is the rest our main focus should always be to be in his presence literally and while you're in his presence then the directions get thrown at you or at us all of us to what to do which direction to move the moment we start trying to plan the moment we start trying to achieve things we move away from seeking his presence and we enter without even realizing it we enter into the fallen state again but the beautiful part about it is that you can always get out of it because we have jesus you know what i'm saying we can always we're not stuck on there we're not enslaved to that but that's why paul was saying don't get entangled again with the bondage of sin like with the bondage of the law because the problem that was they were facing in the new testament was really people coming he was preaching grace and he was saying if you add any law any form of law to this grace 
you're canceling it out. You're pretty much Jesus is of Christ is of no benefit to you. That's what Paul was saying, because people were coming in wanting to keep the message, but at the same time saying we can do this, but still add some type of law to this. Like get circumcised still. And today is the same thing. It's literally it's not getting people circumcised, but now it's more like, oh, you have to fast to be. And I'm not saying anything bad about fasting, but you have to do this. You have to keep the Sabbath. You have to. Any time that you add any type of self-effort to feel any righteousness, you have entered back into the fallen state of man, which is I have to work for this righteousness. I have to enter. You, you can't enjoy the rest of God. But the moment you, you go into full worship and you're seeking the Lord with all of your heart, and that is your number one motive, you have entered into the renewed mindset. And you get to learn more of who you are in Christ. And then now you're not really making a self-effort out of your own self to attain anything, but God brings it to you. It's a huge difference. He brings it to you or he leads you right into it. Huge difference between the two. And it's just, it's so mind blowing and it's just so amazing. And I just like, it really, I'm so passionate about this <laughs> because it's like, it has changed my whole life. And it, and it really, it's really that I'm telling you, that's just the key core of our biggest number one struggle in this life. And this human is literally a struggle between going back to the fallen state of mind and the renewed fallen state renewed. And that's where if we can understand that it will just, it will help us so much that your main focus should always be number one focus is get into the presence of God. Seek him with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with everything that you have and everything else comes to you. He will either lead you into it or it will come right at your door. You don't have to go out of him to seek anything else. It all just comes to you. Literally, I'm telling you, <laughs> that's that's the rest of God. But anyway, but I just I leave it there. I know we gotta keep going, but it's just it's it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful and passionate. I 1,000 percent agree with what you just said because I fought that for uh, three quarters of my life of working for my salvation. You put it in a nutshell. Because I, I thought that these hands were going to work my way into heaven. And it was, so I was so wrong. <laughs> and I'll tell you, the biggest thing that really got me to the point where the Lord could work on my heart was realizing that everything that I worked for, when it failed, I see myself falling into depression. Because what I was yep. focusing on was not God. It was on my will, not his. And it, man, it's, it's just amazing. How you sum that up, it spoke to me like right now. And I already heard this session that you <laughs> taught weeks ago. So you spoke to me again. Come on, Sam. Yeah, I just want to, yeah, Rebecca, what you just went through, what you, that whole other statement, that was a whole other lesson. That was a whole other lesson that we just got. That was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to, what I wanted to point out was, you know, yes, we need to, we don't need the law. And then what happens with and why I believe that a lot of people start going back to that is we're we're impatient. We're not we're not seeing, we're not feeling, we're not this, you know. If we just continuously seek seek him, have it, uh, his will in our lives, he, he'll eventually show us what this and that. But I think, you know, what happens with a lot of people is we think or we get impatient. Our flat as human, we get impatient. We're like well, I guess well, I guess I need to do this. I well, I better start doing this and this. You know, start putting those laws in there. And I, you know, I just wanted to add that that patience. <laughs> we have, we as humans, we need to learn to rest and be patient, meditate. Let Him come to us when He want. You know, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> patience. <laughs> I have I have to say, um. Yes, Rebecca did go into teaching again, and we were talking about the promise, but she dipped over in provision because <laughs> it's actually the writing on the wall of the provision. And Mike did a good job bringing that to us. But Rebecca, I'm gonna ask you again. I'll cover um, the testing of the faith if you'll come back on and just pick up on provision because you're already talking into it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the provision of, yes, and it applies to the provision, all areas of, um, of, of God, because the thing is, is like the number one thing that unfocuses us really 
from God is provision. Let's be real. I've been there. You know, like I said, I was a business, I was a businesswoman, you know, and my husband and I were both business people. And yeah, we were believers. And but a lot of times when we start chasing after provision, we neglect chasing after God. And sometimes it's hard for a lot of believers too to put to like I'm telling you, a believer will believe, most believers will believe that everything else applies to you, healing, everything else but the provision part of it. They don't believe that God can literally, like, okay, they believe that he can bless you, but you still have to do something on your part about it. And that is the mentality that a lot of people feel. It's like, yeah, you still have to go out and seek it. But God never said that. You don't have to go out and seek it. Am I saying that you can't, you don't have to work? Yes. Here's the thing. When we're seeking God with all of our heart, all of our minds, he tells us, he leads us as a father, not as a master, as a father. He leads us into where to go. He will say, I'm going to bring this job opportunity for you. But at the end of the day, even if you are in the job, he is still your main source of provision because he brings the blessings to you the bible says that we have the same blessings as abraham we have the same blessing the favor of god is upon our life and even this morning i'm the testimony from this morning i was praying this morning and the first thing i said lord let your favor be upon me today and you know immediately in my spirit i heard his voice he spoke right into me he said you already have my favor so i was like whoa and there's nothing that i can do meaning like that favor is in my life and as long as I'm tapping into the spirit, I can access that favor. It's over my, he will never take the favor away from you. Now we can block the favor out of our lives by walking in our fallen state of mind. When we walk in the fallen state of mind, flesh, carnal mind, then we start saying, well, I have to earn this. I have to do this. I have to go do that. I have to do this. I have to do that. If I don't go do this, common sense is not going to come at you. You ever heard the saying, money doesn't grow out of trees? I mean, you you hear these things growing up. Money don't grow in trees. You have to go seek it. So that mentality, that's the fallen state of thinking. They think, people think that way. I have to go seek it. It doesn't just come. It don't, it's not going to come knocking at your door. You know, it could come knocking at your door. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying to sit there and just wait. I'm saying this, if God is telling you, I'm bringing it, you, that's where you have to listen to the direction of the Lord. Because he will give every single person a different direction. He can get, he can tell someone I'm going to promote you. He can tell another person, you know, I want you to be in this job until this, because at the end of the day, we're in a mission. We're all on a mission. We're all on assignment. And I know you can agree with me, uh, Shannon, when, in the army, you're working for the army. Your, your job and your career is not, it's not, it's not your main focus. It, let's say if you're a technician, that's not your main focus in the army. You are in the army and your assignment is wherever they put you at. Um, I know that you get to choose your careers, but what I'm just saying is that God will use you through a career if he wants you. He will pull you out of your career and put you in a ministry if he wants to. Is When we're at his services, we're pretty much available to wherever he sends us to. That's the difference between when we're building a career and we're depending upon our career for our source versus we let him be the source in our life. And he will give you the direction. Every single person in this in this chat room right now has a different direction in life that the Lord is leading them into, especially in the area of provision. My question will be, what has the Lord spoken to you about provision? And if, if you, if to say, if some of us can't answer that, that means that we have not heard from him in that area. Now, some can, some can say, well, you know what? He's promised me this in my provision. He's promised me that. So that's where you take the leading step. Okay, well, he's telling you to do this. He's telling you to do that. You see the difference? Like if if when we, when I ask in the provision area, like what has he spoken to you about? What has he said to you in this area? Most people can't answer that. They'll be like, well, no, I have to. It's common sense. I just have to go work and, and make the money. But I noticed that people who are focused on just working and making money, they're stuck on that. It's almost like they're just stuck in that. They're stuck in the same bills. They're stuck in the same pay and the same it doesn't change for them. And they're just like in that roller coaster with finances. And that what I'm saying is that sometimes it might seem like he's not coming through, but he will come through because he never lies. The Bible says that he never lies. So if he says something, he's promised you something, that means he's going to come through. He doesn't lie. 
But the thing is, is really just the key is, is really trusting him and knowing that he's already done all the hard work. We're not cursed like Adam is or was that the you have to by the sweat of your brow. And I know Proverbs talks about if you don't work, you don't eat and all that stuff. But you got to understand that they were all under the law at that time, too. And this new covenant, we entered what he was trying to get the Israelites to enter the rest. The rest is this. God already did all the hard work. My job now is to fully seek him and rest in his labor work. So I'm here serving him wherever he wants me on earth. We bring, he uses us to manifest the kingdom to this earth. That's what we're here to do, to manifest his kingdom on earth. Whatever the kingdom will is, his kingdom will, it comes transferred out through us into this world. That is our assignment here. However he wants you to do that, are we willing to just do that? You know what I'm saying? So that's 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 the area of finance. You don't have to go seek it. Same thing is you don't have to go seek healing. You don't have to go seek. Because it will make more sense if I was to sit here and say to a lot of people, you don't have to go seek your joy. God can give it to you. And all of you guys here in this chat room will agree with me. Yeah, he will. God gives you peace. He gives you joy, right? He gives you healing. You don't have to go out and seek it. He can give it to you. Same thing applies to the finances. He will. Why is it so hard to accept <laughs> that he can bring you the finances just as much as he can bring you peace, joy, and um, everything else that he promises in the Bible? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's really, but the reason why a lot of people struggle with the finance area is because of that one thing. Well, if you don't work, you don't eat. And I get that. And, and there is a truth to that to some extent. But is when you go and seek it on your own, you're not trusting God. You're just putting it upon yourself. I have to do this or otherwise we're not going to make it financially. And a lot of people live that way. Well, it, 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 These it, people it, are wanting really more. They're wanting more I, than what, what he's provided. Let me come in in the last hour. Of course, that'll blow everybody's minds. <laughs> I mean, equal pay, right? <laughs> I tell you all, Rebecca, we should have just let you fix this whole thing. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to say that. You know, um, <laughs> Listening to you talk about provision. Listening to you talk about provision, it made me think about the um, um, Israelites in the wilderness and the manna. So faith through trust. And that's one thing that I picked up is that trust. You got, we got to learn to trust God on every avenue. So then people, he told them not to save any manna for the next day. And I think some people did and they found maggots in it. Because he was going to provide, he was going to give them provision as they need it by day. So every day, here's this fresh new manna. Here's this day, brand new day, fresh new manna. Well, that's the same thing that we face every single day, whether it be in your health, finances, whatever it be. If you had faith, trust, then you wouldn't worry about the things that you worry about, especially when his will says it's to prosper us, not to harm us. So if we trusted in our Father like we were supposed to, then every day of our life would be happy because we would see no stress. We, we wouldn't worry about money. We wouldn't worry about our health because as long as we got that, all he asks from us is for trust and for faith. That's really, if it boils down to it, that's all he really asks from us. So if we gave him that wholeheartedly, what can we expect? The provision. Anything Amen. that we need. You know what I'm saying? It's just getting out of, um, man, I can't wait till 2024. I have never been this <laughs> hyped about a coming year because of the simple fact we're going to dive on into some things that we're getting into talking about right now. It's that separation between this flesh suit, this junk right here. You know, we can't, just because we can't understand it or just because we can't see it, it's hard for us to accept it. That is so backwards. You know what I'm saying? Our whole faith, our, everything is built on the unseen. So for me to sit here and say, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this tomorrow or worry about anything of tomorrow, is that really questioning and doubting in my faith? Yes, it is. 
because the same God that has done it then and then and then will do it again. If he done it, man, I'm going to tell you, uh, the testimony is huge because I get happy. I'll tell this testimony right now. I got convicted this morning in Otaya. This morning, we had a prayer, and Mike's not on here because Mike Suggs' dad is back in the hospital. All right, he's got swelling, and he's got a lot of complications going on. So as he's talking in our morning meeting for prayer, I say, all right, Mike, we know exactly how to pray. We're going to pray for your father. So I open up prayer this morning, and I start speaking live. And I'm using this authority that God has given me through his word, through the Holy Spirit, and I'm speaking against these certain things. And it takes off around the circle as these men start to pray. Well, as soon as I shut my mouth, the next man went to praying, and it come to me clear as day. Clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Just sing. So I'm like reasoning this out. I don't know where this is coming from, but clap your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. So when it made around the circle, I about figured it out now that that was a prophetic word. I said, all right, guys, throughout the day, if you think about Mike's dad, clap your hands, say, thank you, Jesus. Everybody was like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we hugged each other's neck and we went on to work. I got in and I sat down and it ate me alive. Because of a simple fact, the spirit told me to clap my hands right then. He didn't tell me to tell these men to clap their hands throughout the day. He didn't tell me to tell these men to say, thank you, Jesus, throughout the day. It was right then, and I did not listen. I opened up my phone as I never pay attention in the morning meeting, in the safety meeting. <laughs> never do. I'm always in my phone. But I opened up, and my daily word was um, Psalms 47. And Psalms 47, verse 1, was right there in my face. It says, oh, clap your hands. All you people, shout to God with the voice of triumph. When I read that, y'all, I'm going to tell y'all almost humble. Because now I know that I disregarded something that the Spirit told me to do. And he come back, our gracious Father, our so nice Father, our so merciful Father, come back and he showed me. This is just how I opened my phone and it went to that scripture, the same thing that was in my spirit. And I'm like, God, that little doubt. That little, you know, just that flesh reasoning. When all I had to do, I could have stopped prayer right then and say, hey, everybody clap your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. And then man would have did it. It was at that moment. And I was like, look at the doubt. Look at this water and stuff down. You got to start moving. You got to start hearing. I'm talking to me. I'm not talking to y'all. If the spirit leads you to do something, do it right then. Don't let flesh water it down. Do not do it because you don't know what blessings that the spirit is trying to provide. What provision? Yeah. Let's use that word. What provisions the spirit is trying to give if you were to move when he tells you to move. You know what I'm saying? And I, it tore me to pieces. So I had to go out and confess. I found my brother that was out there, Grover, Sam. And I was like, Grover, I just had my butt whooped. And he was like, why? And I told him the story and he started laughing. <laughs> he was like, I bet you won't do it again. And I'm like, no, I won't. And I told that testimony to line up with what Rebecca's saying. In the spirit man, we don't have to worry about provision because the provision is already provided. It's already provided. All we got to do is just have trust in the Father to do what he said he already gonna, has done. Come on, Craig. You know I like to talk. <laughs> if we're going to talk about provision... Can everybody agree that every time they turn on the news that we're looking at the final days? We have all of the ingredients, all of the drama, all of the promises. I'm not saying it's tomorrow. I'm saying we're in the era of the final times. If we can agree with that, the outpouring of the spirit is promised to be greater in the end than what it started with on the day of Pentecost. The promise of provision. Ain't it, ain't it. He calls us into kingdomship, right? So who's actually standing on the transfer of wealth in the final days? He's gonna he's going to fund the kings and queens here on earth. Amen. To be world changers. 
What are we going to do to achieve it? Nothing. If his voice, if his words do not come back void, he declared it. Therefore it is. I just have to receive in the faith that it's going to be because then I'm a believer in his actions. I'm exercising faith. And I, Craig, I yeah. wanted to I wanted to agree with you that the Lord has shown me and Andrew that exact. And you know, now that you're mentioning it, I'm going to confirm it because of, the Lord works in confirmation and witnesses. Is that yes, there is some kingdom assignments that He's doing coming this year, coming next year, and it's just He is going to fund. And he's preparing his people because there is funding coming for his people. Now, you might hear in the news that there's going to be lack probably coming next year in some areas, whether it be however they're trying to do it. But here's the thing what God is doing. He's lifting up his people to be the very resource areas that he's going to be funding those people. He's going to be funding his people, his church, in, in large amounts because we're going to be the ones that people are going to look to for that resource, for that, there, people are going to start turning to Christ because of what's going to be coming. He's shown us that. And that's why it's like, he's saying, you don't have to go seek this provision. I am bringing this to you. And it's going to be where you were saying, trans literally there's transfers of wealth happening. There's money that has been stored from the wicked that he is going to be transferring it over to his people. And I can confirm that because I have seen it. I've heard it. I mean, the Lord has been repeating this to me for like the last two years. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll say, what is it? When is this coming? Because, but the thing is, he's preparing because he has to take the, the focus away from, from the money, meaning like people chasing after this and putting it on him. Because here's the thing, when these transfers of wealth come over, is it going to have you or is he going to have you? So that's, that's the thing. He's got to prepare your heart for this thing because that money is going to be used for his kingdom where he's going to, uh, he's going to, you know, I just, I truly feel there's instructions coming with this wealth that's going to be transferred over for his kingdom purpose. But sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. I'm just, I was just so pat. I can hear you and I'm, I'm over here like stirring up inside. <laughs> so, but yeah. Can I, please, I cannot please say something. Y'all kill me. Craig, Rebecca, if man, y'all killing me. I'm telling you, I got ants crawling all over my body. I, Sean, is going to jump on me when I say this. I promise. Because we... <laughs> Look. So, <laughs> Craig opened it up. Rebecca came in tag team, just like a wrestling. All right? Man, it just... I am so full of joy right now because it's starting to make sense. Me and Sean have been working on something. I mentioned uh, something to Mike Taylor, and then I mentioned it to Sean, and it kept running through my mind, and I mentioned it to Sammy. And hearing Craig talk, Right then, and Rebecca backing it up. Right then, it started drawing things together. So we talked about the identity, trying to figure out who we are in Christ, and knowing that on a firm foundation, knowing who we are. We talked about this armor of God, these tools that he gives us to go into battle. But you don't get those. Y'all remember that session that we talked? You don't come in the army and they give you an M16 and everything to go to war. They train you first. So we learn about these tools. We're talking about um, uh, the influence. We're talking about true manhood and womanhood because we got couples that are married. And we got the family unit. And we got children. So now all this is like shaping and it's going hand in hand. We get down here. We talk about these gifts. We talk about the fruits. We talk about the promise. We talk about um. Y'all see this? Everybody, raise your hand if you know what this is. It's a chest second board. Heaven. No, second it heaven. It's a chest <laughs> You must, Craig. Oh. All right. Well, yeah. Let me show y'all. Let me show y'all something. So any real chess player has his own set, right? And in this set, this is his. So when you open this box, There's pieces. Every piece has its own place. So as you take these pieces out of this felt, 
you turn this board over, and every one of those pieces has a design spot on this board of play. So with that being said, just like Craig said in the ending and the last days, can y'all are y'all not aware and can y'all not see that the Lord is shaping his soldiers? He's body online. He's placing the pieces in their proper places. And not until that last piece is in its proper place, the game won't begin. And that game is the grand, uh, ground. That game is not in this flesh. That game is in the spirit. You're talking about the master. They call a, uh, a great chess player a master chess player. So we're referring to God. And who is the opposing force? What does the word Satan mean? So as God is taking his people, plucking them up, and he's taking them through this wilderness, and he's burning off this chafe, and he's getting rid of these impurities through the testing of these, the faith. Why does bad things happen to us, Lord? Why are we? Because he's got to get these impurities out of you. He's preparing you for himself to put you back in play. He's activating things inside of you to be able to get on this board. This board is to build the kingdom of heaven. This game is we go out and fight for souls every day. This is the biggest thing in the universe, souls. God sees everybody as souls. He don't see black. He don't see white. He don't see women. He don't see men. He don't see sin. That's the biggest thing. He don't see our sin. When he looks at us, he sees the blood of his son. He sees the souls. He sees the greatness that man so we have to start looking at this and we have to start shaping our ourselves and everything when we start listening to that spirit we have to start let it activate things inside of us because it's forming us into these pieces that are in this belt because when he pulls us out there's things that's got to happen there's transformations that's got to happen what did he tell nicodemus you must be reborn again you must be different you must be changed you got to go through change so if you're still what you were 10 years ago, if you're still what you were five years ago, you're not ready. The spirit comes upon you and it makes change. You don't, I, I'll put it like this. I have tried to quit addictions myself and those addictions always came back. But when the Holy Spirit changes, you don't even think. It's like, I can't even remember when I quit because you're a new creation. He starts change in you as a process through the sanctification. And once he gets you to that level for activation, then you move. You don't move according to your own will. You move according to God's will. And his will is for the building of his kingdom. So I'm telling you, me and Sean, we've been talking about a lot of deep when you're talking about this chess board. Because a master player, this is interesting, a master chess player does not play one move ahead. He does not play two to three moves ahead. He plays up to 20 moves ahead. 20. 20 moves. I've seen people in check make in three moves. A master chess player plays up to 20 moves. So when I sit in flesh and I say, God, why am I going through this season that I'm going through? Lord knows I ain't done what they accused me of doing. Lord knows I'm tired of being locked down in my home and can't visit my family, can't do all this. Lord, why is this happening to me? Then that spirit man says, stop it. Your brothers have come back to me. People are praying for you. They're going on their knees talking to me for you. They hadn't talked to me in years. Stop thinking with your worldly mind, for one, your carnal mind for one second, and let me do what I do. And I say, okay, daddy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit down. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. And this is how we surrender. It's that surrender. But to surrender, you got to trust. And once you get to that trust, man, I don't know how everybody's relationship with their parents were, but I know how mine was. My daddy's word was law because I, he gave me this love where I trusted every word that come out of his mouth. But that's why I was hurt when he didn't do what he said he was going to do because I trusted him. So if I looked at my father, and he done whatever humanly possible to do whatever he told me that he was going to do and do the best he could for me. 
how am I not looking at God to do the same? So we sit and we talk about this provision that's already provided. We talk about the testing of our faith to shed all the things and impure things out of us to make us pure, to make us acceptable. We're in preparation for him. We're in preparation for him. We say, Lord, I'm less of me and more of you. So talking on this testing of faith, less of me and more of you. All of you and none of me. How do you pray? But when we say that, do we really understand that Jesus Christ in the flesh went through great suffering? And in that relationship, if we want to experience Christ, don't we think we have to go through some suffering? That's how you relate. That's how you understand. How can I understand the pain of a person that's lost somebody close to unless I've lost somebody close to me? How can I experience like the agony of sitting in a jail cell as I'm trying to minister to somebody that's in a jail cell unless I've been there myself? Now that I have been here myself, my heart is bleeding for all the guys that are there because I know what it's like. So when we say less of us and more of you, do we really mean that? Are we willing? Do we trust them enough to really say that with all of our heart? Or are we just saying it to check the box? Because if you want to be like Christ, then it must be suffering. You have to suffer because you won't understand. He reveals things through this suffering, through this testing. I'm telling you, I, look, I know I talk. Anybody else got anything to say? Because I'm feeling good over here. I got back sweat. Come on, Craig. I've had two and a half years of sickness. <clears throat> and that's been a tough lump, especially since I know I walk in a gift of healing my prayers, I just know my prayers are effective when it comes in healing. So I've challenged myself in two and a half years time, you know, wow, why, why is this? And it's not, I'm not operating in healing. I should probably, I'm the first witness to the healing that comes through me. So with everything being said, I've come to this conclusion. There's no way I would have ever volunteered to get as weak as I did to face death several times, probably six times in the last two and a half years, literally be weak enough to pass away. Six different ways, maybe more. Um, I wouldn't have volunteered to go there. But out of that, from my weakness, I've experienced his greatness in levels that I would have never volunteered for, period. So he has ways of getting us where we need to be. And, uh, and they're not always wonderful, light, fluffy, flowery paths. But I understand for those that overcome, and I also understand in your weakness, I'll experience his greatness. And, and I can't emphasize that amount at anywhere close to as much as that walk that was traveled. Yep. Talking about that count it all joy. I just said that in the test of faith. Um, man, it's, Night's been good already to me. Only about to y'all. I feel like I'm in church. Our last, which is Craig will come back on our last, but uh, I missed the, the session for the wilderness. And I know it was good because Justin has a great testimony. So I've got, I've not yet went back and watched that session. And I've heard all about it, that it was great. But uh, one thing, I don't know if it was covered. Y'all let me know if it was. One thing when I hear about the wilderness, you know, I've always thought of God delivered the Israelites from Egypt out of bondage, and he took them into this wilderness. And before I went to study in and, you know, trying to get the Lord, know the Lord myself, I always wondered that as I read. Why would he take them out of a, it was bondage, but it was still something. You know, they didn't have to worry about food. They were fed. Um, they had homes, but he brought them out of bondage. And he put them in this wilderness. Well, I was listening to um, a podcast, 
and the guy made a very good statement. He said he had to bring him in the, into the wilderness to get the Egypt out of it. And when he said that, it made all the sense in the world. They couldn't enter the promised land with Egypt still in their heart because the promised land would have been the new Egypt. And when I heard that, it just, man, it resonated. I'm talking about the light bulbs gone because now I understood the hardships that they were enduring was the separation of them, their spirit, and their flesh. So flesh was used to having this kind of food, and flesh was used to having a roof over their head, and flesh was doing all this. But God brought them out to the wilderness, and he still gave them provision. Everything that they had in Egypt, God gave them in that wilderness. It was just different. It didn't look like what they thought it would look like. And a lot of times when we go through something and we go through our wilderness stage, and I, I say that's where I am right now, and I feel this on a whole nother level, I feel like it took this for me. And I know all of you know my situation. If it would have been any later, there wouldn't have been change. If it would have been any easier, it wouldn't have been change. Um, I feel like I've been in that felt, in that box for a long time. Um, I've always been a people person. I've always been a person that, that people would tell on to my joy and my light. And that's even when I wasn't seeking God's face like I was supposed to. You know, I've always been the laugher and the, you know, the joker and what, and people were drawn to that. So these were gifts that God gave me that I operated in, in the wrong place. I wasn't in my calling. I wasn't in my anointing. I wasn't doing any of that. I was in the world. So God knows your heart better than you do. So when it comes time for the testing of the faith and it comes time for the wilderness period, it's going to be testing and wilderness according to the person. You know, I can sit here and say, I don't know why I'm going through this. There's so many people out there in the world that, you know, might have been more fit for this or more able to handle this because I have my bad days. But then I think, would I have changed? Would I have made the steps that I've made in the past several months if this wouldn't have happened? If it had been something, a slap on the wrist, a little health scare, or anything like that? No. The answer is absolutely not. So in this wilderness, I felt several things fall off. I felt parts of me die. I felt, um, man, I don't even feel like myself. I'm not the same person that I was two years ago because that's when the change started. He even prepared me for this season. The encounter. I come to my encounter like, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, and I remember going in that place, and I was thinking, Lord, what have I got myself into? These people are in there hooping and hollering. I've been in church, Pentecostal all my life, but never in that kind of setting where all these men hugging each other and just joy, full of joy. And I got in there, and that Friday night was sort of awkward. That Saturday, there was a breakthrough, and that Sunday, I didn't want to go home. And every, haven't missed it, I missed one encounter since that moment. Every encounter, I kept filled and filled and filled. Next thing you know, I'm speaking. Next thing you know, I'm praying. Next thing you know, I'm praying like publicly. This ain't Shannon. You know, I used to be like, let's say God's word. Hey, you come over here and pray for us. But now it's like the boldness. So now I'm teaching at the encounters. And I'm listening to these guys come up and give their testimonies. And I'm involved. And now we're on Bible study. And right before this season hits, there was a vision at the encounter that somebody told me that God gave them, and it was a vision of this very situation days before it happened. Y'all, I got to believe. So now if I believe that that vision was true because it actually happened, then I got to believe in the provision after this wilderness. And that's going to be, I'm telling y'all, all y'all are invited to my celebration because when that, when that day happens and that day drops, I'm going to tell you, I don't care who's around. I don't care who hears me. I've been wanting to do it. Melissa, I'll tell you, I had a sermonette to do in church, and it was sort of different because my family come down. I go to a church here in Crestview, and I got really happy. I got, I'm talking about really happy. So I walk away from my notes, and I'm speaking. And next thing you know, the spirit has got me. 
and I'm going in to tell him my testimony. And the um, elder of the church that was in charge said, Brother Wilkerson, Brother Wilkerson, you're past for five minutes. You're past for five minutes. And I looked back and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I've been up there about 15 minutes. And I sat down. Well, everybody that come to the church that in support of me, they were upset. They was like, you were bringing the word. Why did he shut you down? But I was just happy. And I come and sit down. And he called me. He was like, I don't want you to uh, take offense to me sitting you down. You know, we just have to stay in line with this and stay in line. I was like, no. Because the Lord told me that it wasn't yet time to tell my testimony. I'm just coming. Oh man, I can't wait. I can't wait. Somebody else talk. I'll talk till 10 o'clock. Y'all know this. Somebody had their hand up. Mark had his hand up. Craig had his hand up. Shannon over there drinking coffee, eating hey, some I chips. Think, I think Craig had his hand up first. Go ahead, Craig. I'll start. I just take it down. Talking again, Go Craig. Ahead. Come on. Go ahead. I just didn't take it down from earlier. No, I was uh, just uh, listening to what what you said, Craig, and what Shannon's saying, Craig. And uh, you know, we can we can talk here. I mean, you brought up a good point. We can talk here, and we can get all excited for Jesus. And 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 we all know what the Scripture says. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be. Uh, we're we're going to have our trials and everything thing and you know Craig talking about his you know near death experiences uh, I can tell you what sort of what sort of started my prolonged uh, time in the wilderness was um, I had I had uh, encountered a so I'll just uh, I'll get I don't mean to get weird about this uh, I had I had started witnessing to a guy who was uh, drunk um, in my twenties. I was twenty, probably twenty four, and uh, I was I was witnessing to him, and I don't even know why I was witnessing to somebody who was drunk, you know. Um, and then all of a sudden, he grabbed me by my neck, he pinned me up against the trailer, he yelled, he he changed his voice, and he said, "Mark, I am Satan, and I will kill you." And he pulled his hand back to kill me. I uh, I broke loose of his grip, got away. I called the 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 police ambulance because I knew the guy was in his right state of mind. But it was scary because I had heard whether it was Satan himself or another demon. Um, I was confronted right there, and that really scared me. Um. Um, and, and it made me think about, you know, Mark, you're Mark. Or, I mean, it really means something to live a Christian life. I mean, this is the spiritual warfare we're dealing with. This is what we're, we're, we're going through. And this is what it means to be a Christian and live a Christian life. And this is the type of, conf uh, the, the confrontations and stuff you're going to have. And, uh, I kind of, I kind of backed away. I don't want to say backed away from Christianity. Let's just say I got, I went from being on fire to God to be a very um, average, you know, Christian to, you know, just the basic beliefs and stuff. Um, and then just recently I shared with y'all, I think it was last week, you know, the deal with the work and the praying and spiritual warfare and my wife having to go to the hospital. And I, what I didn't tell you was when she, after part of the conversation was, you know, Mark, why are we going through this? I'm like, well, I've been trying for a long time to get a bunch of Christian brothers together to pray and I haven't been able to do it. And I got to talk to every one of them the day before to all of us to meet in a certain spot at a certain time, they all agreed. And then you had to go to the hospital and uh, I wasn't there and you know we never got together we never prayed we never it never went through it and and this this meeting of us brothers getting together had had been taking place had been trying for over a couple of weeks and uh so she asked me you know she says hey you know why do you think this is happening and i was like carrie this isn't about you this is about the fact that you know you know the enemy never wanted me to show up to work they never wanted us praying for, you know, something, something that's uh, amazing that's about to happen in that shop. And it it's constantly getting thwarted. It's constantly getting broken up. 
and she told me, and so my wife, she has a uh, several health issues. Uh, one of them is uh, AFib. Uh, what is that? Uh, atrial fibrillation. And she had it one time. Um, she's she hasn't had it for a couple of years now. And she just thought that morning that she was breathing hard. She knew she had it. We have like a little EKG machine at home. It said her heart rate was normal. She insisted on going to the hospital. We went to the hospital. So that, that kind of took us up to. They did the test. They ran another test. They said her heart rate, her sinus rhythm was normal. But, you know, and she just didn't understand why this was happening to her. And, of course, when I sort of explained the spiritual warfare part of this, my wife was very honest with me and straight up. She said, Mark, I don't I don't I don't know that I want you going to these Bible studies anymore. I don't know that I want you going to these men's encounters. I mean, if this is the type of stuff that we are going to be facing and dealing with, she says, I don't know that I'm ready to take this on. Now, this is interesting enough this is this is me i'm willing to take this on and and i understand i understand you know the the sort of the the spiritual warfare behind this and what it could mean and and obviously um craig and shannon understand this as well how just how far you you know you may have to give up or or the extent you may have to go for your faith and and my wife is not there yet and she's she's somewhat scared of this thing you know she's scared of this and this is this is it's important you know we can get excited and do all this stuff but you know understand there's going to come a time when you're really going to have to you know go forward and uh accept you know accept this you know it's it's we're going to be persecuted in every direction um and i just thought shannon and craig they brought up a good point is it this this will cost you. You will be put on the spot where you will have to, you know, um, I had, you know, our family, we got put on the spot where, you know, we grew up, uh, we grew up Pentecostal and uh, as well in the assembly of God churches and we spoke in tongues and, and, you know, holy rollers and everything else. And, you know, one of the hardest things I had to do was when my dad was having a uh, bypass surgery on his heart. You know, one of the hardest things he had to do was my mom just instantly grabbed hands and said, hey, we got to pray for your dad's healing. And it just happened to be where I was at with the Lord at the time. I said, do we want to pray for dad's healing or do we want to pray for the Lord's perfect will? And I hated it. I felt like the bad guy. I felt like the bad guy in the situation. Like, well, well of course, everybody wants dad's healing because we want him to live and everything else. And we ended up praying for God's perfect will and it would it would come to pass that three days after the surgery my dad would pass and go home to be with the Lord um but you know it's it's not always you know like I said it's nice to be in this group and have these Bible studies but you will you continue on the faith you will be tested you will be tried and you will be you know you will have to make these tough decisions and uh you know, what, what Craig's talking about and what Shannon went through is very, very real as a Christian. And that's yeah, really but, all but I got to say. There's a training into victory. It, it the, the testing and trials are not there to set us up for failure. Jesus sets us up for success. If If he answered our prayer early, we would never know how far we could reach. So, you know, it's know the perception and 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 it doesn't need to be in the negative context because it's all about victory. It's all about making us better. It's all about that we don't even realize what we can achieve. And through these things, Jesus shows us how and that we can and and it's all a path of victory so that that's all i'm you know it really is he props us up every time he gets the opportunity
Come on, Andrew or Rebecca. No, I just wanted um, I wanted to add to what uh, Mark was saying. Um, so I wanted to read this verse because I think this is really important because I was also, when I became a Christian, I was born again in a Pentecostal church. Well, technically I was born again before I went there, but I kind of, my first introduction to Christianity was through a Pentecostal church. And for years, I, um, you know, you hear it all the time in the altar, you know, the devils comes to steal, kill and destroy. And, um, and I, I feel in this, you know, I'm just going to share, I'm not, I'm not at all in any kind of way um, pointing fingers at anything or anyone or I myself was in this situation where you put a lot of focus on not you. I'm saying for me, like we sometimes put a lot of focus on the devil. And I wanted to read this real quick. Um, it says in Colossians 2.15, it says in this same in this way, he well, he's talking about Jesus. He disarmed. And that there's a past tense on that. He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So when I read this, it really just hit me. One day I was reading this and it just hit me so strong. I'm like, wait a minute. He disarmed every authority, every principality, every dominion. They have been disarmed. And he put them to public shame on top of that. And by his victory over the cross, right? So what I'm here, what I'm saying is this, is that all these things that come your way, sickness, um, like with that guy, you know, with the testimony, uh, what Mark was saying with the guy that threw his head against, uh, I can't remember what it was against, but all these attacks that come in in your life, these were already uh, uh, something the enemy planned against your life a long time ago. These things were put in your life that were going to come at you. Okay, my daughter's cancer. All this stuff was coming because of what happened, because of the sin that entered into the world. But God foreknew. This is the part I want you guys to understand. God foreknew what was going to come. He foreknew everything that the enemy had planned against your life. And in every bad situation, God, through Jesus, the finish, because remember, it's finished work. It is finished. Through his work, his finished work, he predestined already, past tense, your victory and every single attack that the enemy will come at you with and i'm here and i can confidently tell you that every bad situation that you will ever face in this world there is already a victory there for you so the issue is it's not whether god is going to do something about it or not he already did and that's what we have to that is part of the renewed mindset like i said the old mindset the the, the fallen mindset has fear they 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 they're subject and they subject themselves to whatever comes the outcome comes they accept it and god is saying no i have a victory so for example my brother craig right that sickness was already planned by the enemy cuz god didn't give him that sickness it was already planned but god used the sickness that was coming at him and he used it to transform craig the same thing with my situation with the situation with shannon God already knew that Shannon was going to make some decisions in the past that was going to eventually lead or even some issues with whatever the situation was with his friends. He knew that circumstance was going to come to him. This whole situation with court is not something that God brought to him, but it was the enemy that pre-planned it already trying to get ahead of God. And God already foreknew because God knows the Bible says that he foreknew, therefore he predestined. So because he knew it was coming, he said, I'm going to use the situation that Shannon is going to go through and I'm going to take the situation. I'm going to turn it around and prepare him for the plan that I have for him. And that is why in every situation we have to submit ourselves to the spirit because there is victory already there for him, for us, for every single one of us. There's victory. My daughter went through cancer and I can tell you that has already happened. 
but she had victory over it. She was healed and there, and there's nothing wrong with her body. Everything is perfect. During the time that we were going through it, there was moments of doubt, but it, the thing is that I had to realize was it was already done. Her healing was already there. Her, her victory was already there, but fear cancels out the grace. So here's what fear does. When we get fear over the attacks of the enemy, what it does is it makes us experience what's the attack coming at us. We're still going to get victory over it as believers in Christ, but we're going to get to experience the effects of the attack because we take our mind off of Christ. Remember, Paul had a thorn in his flesh, right, which was the persecution. Paul prayed three times, Lord, take this away from me, right? Just like if we're praying, Lord, please take this. Uh, Shannon is praying, Lord, take this situation away from me. And what is God's response is my grace is sufficient. And my grace is literally sufficient, meaning you're going to go through it, not because God put you there, but because the enemy came to attack you, but he's using it. You don't have to suffer the consequences. You don't have to suffer through it because you're going to be on his rest through the storm. That is the, because he already planned the victory for you that you were going to face through that situation. It's already done. It just hasn't played out yet. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. What, what we're living right now to heaven is history. It already happened. Everything has already happened. It's just not playing out. That's why he says, whatever you speak shall be done in heaven. We bring the will of God into earth, meaning we don't know exactly what's going to play out, but he knows everything. And we're just bringing what's already written, what's already there. We're bringing it into existence and manifesting into the earth. But to God, this is all history. This already is already written and happened. It just hasn't happened yet in our eyes. But every area we have, and what I feel, um, Mark, is for some reason when you were sharing that testimony, and I can be wrong, I could be wrong, and but I want you to check, you know, if you're able, I don't know if you're able to, to but I feel that there was a, an, um, an agreement with fear from that experience, which could be, uh, maybe renouncing it out of your life, any type of fear agreement with the enemy, he, according to the word of God, does not have any more weapons against you. So therefore, we have already the victory in Christ. Through Christ, our life is joined to him. Therefore, we have victory over him. He, the more confidence you have in Jesus, who you are, sorry, the more confidence that you have in who you are in Jesus, the less you're going to be affected by any of the attacks of the enemy in your life. Because do, does the enemy come and attack me? Yes, he does. But I noticed that it became less effective when I, the more confidence I have in who I am, the, the weaker his strength becomes in my life. The weaker, because it's in who you are in him. So the less you know, and the less you know of who you are in him, the more fear you have. The, the more you know who you are in him, the less fear you have. So it's almost like it's, it's a, but I wanted us to understand that the enemy truly doesn't have any, any victory over us. He doesn't have any power over us. He's been disarmed completely. It's just that every situation that already came planned to us, we already have a victory on it. That's what I'm trying to explain. But yes, sorry. That's what I wanted to say. I didn't mean to take so long. When you speak, speak. Open your mouth and let the Holy Spirit rise. Come on, Sam. Well, as Rebecca was going through that, what hit me, what shot me, or when you're talking about chess and you're talking about that's, you know, God's plan for the chess, but our own lives, we, we look at it as God's, we're playing chess with our own lives. You see what I'm saying? You were saying chess, God's picks all pieces, everything that, that uh, needs to be in place. And once he gets it all there, it's going to go forward, but everything that we go through Christ or through uh, everything that we going through within our faith and, and all that is also we're the chessboard. You get what I'm saying? You can look at it that way too. Cause once she was, we, because all these trials and tribulations that we're going through is just setting the pieces for that last piece for us to make our move for Christ, you know? So we, you know, I was just, that, that's what hit me as well. It's not just God's chess board playing, it's ours too. Comes back, it's 
back to that level. And what I also wanted to just say is all these, everything that we go through within the wilderness and all the things that happen to us and all the experiences, all that does is if we truly believe in the Lord and have him with us, you know, we might not see it at that time that it's happening. And we're, uh, 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 but once it's over and we look back and go, wow, this is what happened. All that's doing is giving us wisdom. It's giving us more uh, power in his faith. It's just growing our relationship with him saying, I, I, I understand now what you're going through. And I'm Shannon, I'll just, I'll just, when you were talking about you, you can just see yourself as a prime example of this. Like if it was a slap on the hand, you wouldn't be here right now, what you're doing. You had to go through this hard, this this hard situation to get where you're at now and understand and really see what God can do in your life. Because like you said, if it was just slapping a ham, you would you'd probably been okay, up, I'm good. You'd be going back to the same thing. You know, that just shows it gives us wisdom, gives us confidence, gives us that that knowing that God is there, giving us that closeness, that that relationship with him. Yeah. You made me think about something, Sam. Uh, me and you can relate to this definitely because we're prior Army, and the Army teaches you in certain ways that other branches of the service don't teach you. Number one, somebody, I think it was uh, Rebecca that had mentioned this earlier. In the Army, when you come in, you have one job. They let you choose jobs, but your primary job is infantry. So every person that signs that paper and comes in, you're a frontline person, but then you learn how to do a skill. So while you're doing this skill, if they need a frontline person, guess what? You're prepared. So going back to that, talking about this pain, the suffering, this um, testing of faith, trials and tribulations, whatever you may want to call it. Going back to the military, when you come in the basic, people come into the military for several different reasons. You know, you got your people jumping on their enlistment bonus. You know. I remember when enlistment bonuses was fifty thousand dollars. You sign the paper and go do a couple of years. Um, longevity, as in a career. Some people come in to be career soldiers or uh, whatever the Air Force calls it. Uh, people come in as a last resort because there was a time in the past where people were faced with jail or joined the military, and we all know this. But when they get you in that first day, they're gonna line you up. And they're going to see what you're about. And then they're going to hammer you. They're going to put you through all kind of testing. They're going to test your body to the place where you're about broke. They're going to push you to the limits where it's painful. It doesn't pain. Air Force, y'all, Navy, Marine, I don't care what branch. Boot camp is terrible. It is terrible because they test your limits. But guess what? When it comes time for you to do your job, and doing your job is not rear detachment, primary duty station. That's not your job. War is a soldier's job. And when it comes time for war, you're going to be thankful. All that can, that was painful because now you're prepared to go out and do your job at home. We used to go through a thing called the gas chamber in the Army. You remember that, Simon? <laughs> they put you in there, no mass on. They break these pills. You're in this little team and you're so scared of them and you have not come all the way out to know. Well, they had to do that to put you in a similar situation that if you were hit with chemical warfare, chemical warfare, <laughs> that you would automatically, second nature, go straight to your gas mask, put it on your face, clear and seal, pull the straps. Second nature. And it would save your life. But you knew you had just went through that mustard, <laughs> that pepper spray gas or whatever they call it back then, that was so terrible at the time. So there's reason for the test. There's reason for the purification. There's reason for all this. We can't, like Craig said, we can't not look at this as a negative thing. These are things that's got to happen in a purification process because we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven like this. The word says that we are filthy and undeserving. The only reason we get an opportunity is because Jesus Christ came as an ultimate sacrifice. We don't have to kill goats. We don't have to slaughter lambs. We don't have to do any of that. 
he was the sacrifice of all. And that's our greatness. So now, to prepare us for the Father, we go through things to purify us, to shed us of things picked up in this dirty world. Uh, we can go to several places in the Bible. Transfiguration of Jesus. When his glory was shown to his disciples, there was a change between Jesus in the flesh and Jesus in his glorified figure. That's why that's in there. You look at Job. All right. Somebody just, Sam just said this, and Rebecca was speaking of this. The devil, nowhere in scripture that I have read, did it say that the devil asked to test Job? God offered Job up. You know why he offered Job up? Because he already seen the end. He already knew Job was going to make it through the test. He already knew this. But he put Job in there for a lot of different reasons. But knowing the end was the big. He knew it. So when we come up to these trials and tribulations that we face, and especially you, Mark, look, an old man told me one time, if nothing's happening in your life, be very, very alert. If the devil's not trying you, if the Lord's not allowing him to try you, then the devil's probably already got you. You're not a threat. But if he's throwing curveballs at you, hitting you in the back of the head with rocks, baby sick, wife sick, job pissing you off, then you probably got a job to do. You probably got a job to do that he don't want to happen. He don't want that chess piece to make it to that chessboard. So keep your head up. Stay in prayer because he's given us weapons to defend ourselves in that armor. Prayer. There's power in prayer. So when he comes at you, go to prayer. Talk to daddy. You and your wife pray, pray together. This woman right here has prayed me through a lot of stuff. But in turn, I pray for her the same way because he's coming after us. We know we got a calling on our life just like everybody on here. So if you expect that your life is just going to be peaches and cream, I'm sorry to tell you. No, it is not. <laughs> no, I don't. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but no, it's not. But count it all. I want to sign up for the peaches and cream plan. <laughs> I am going to read you this, and then I'm done for the night. So in Luke 9, let me swap back over here because I was in a whole other page. Luke 9 and 23. It says, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For who desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is a man if he gained the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. That'll tell you right there, man. Everything in this flesh, it don't even matter. I said this, I can't say this no clear. It don't matter. The, if the dog gone on, man, I the per I did a, a thing on uh, you study the other night. I, I got a rope. And at the end of this rope, I had a piece of tape. And my rope's like 100 foot long. And I pulled it across the stream. I said, you know what's wrong with humans right now? All of us flesh bags. We're looking at this lifespan. This rope is a lifespan. We're looking at this part. This is what you live on earth. And I said, but after you accept Christ, this is what you have. And I start pulling that rope out. And it just went on and on and on. I said, but we focus on that inch, that little piece of life or little piece of time that we have here on this earth. Not even focus on the endless heaven Christ. This is our problem. We got to stop focusing in with flesh. Stop focusing on things of the world and start worrying about our eternal. Start worried about where our soul is going to spend for eternity. Man. It, it just makes you, when you really think about it, it makes you feel foolish to a point. Why am I sad and upset about several different things that's going on when my soul may be in jeopardy? I think about that all the time. Every time I want to get depressed, every time I want to 
get angry, every time I want to get sad, I think about eternity. Come on, Sam. Well, I before I wanted to, I, I was yelling at you. My, my thing was off before you start going up because it's been twice that we talked about military and, and the situation is, hey, we have a job, and then what's our main focus? You got to remember, our main, you got your main job, but the main focus, you're, you're constantly training for the battle. No matter what you do, we're all ground soldiers. You're always constantly training for the battle. You know, you've got your main job, but you're constantly training for that battle. And that's what we need to be doing is constantly training for that spiritual battle. I 100% agree. 100% agree. And every day, constant training, 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 being ready for the activation. We're waiting on our act activation orders from the Lord to move. And we can't move if we're not ready. We can't move if we're sitting and getting fat and not practicing what we're supposed to be reading our word. But that's a whole nother session. Does anybody have anything else before I pray us out? And we'll wait till next Tuesday, which is our last session of the year. We've made it a year. Well, close to a year. We're out of 23, going into 24. I think that's great. And I'm looking forward to spending all of 24 with all of y'all learning great new things. Anybody got hey, anything before we pray out? Um, Shannon, I wanted, I wanted to, I don't know, this just came to me right now, that Paul, Apostle Paul was um, in house arrest um, I don't know if you. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Apostle Paul's in house arrest, and that is actually where he wrote a lot of his uh, letters. So even you though nothing, you ain't got nothing better to do, Rebecca. No, but what, no, but what I'm saying is he was he was such a busy apostle, going from place to place. I don't think if he wouldn't have, if that wasn't in the agenda for him to go on that house arrest, he would never sit down and we wouldn't be reading his letters, most of his letters right now. So what I'm saying is that there's a reason and a purpose for every season, you know what I'm saying? So, it, it, and that's something that he already foreknew was coming and he already was prepared for it. The Lord had prepared him for that. So he wasn't for two years, I think it was two years that he was in house arrest, that he was writing letters, he was getting busy, he was ministering to people right where he was at. And then the, obviously, you know, so it's just to encourage you is this whatever season we're in, there's always a purpose that God has in there. And whatever season you're in right now, what in that area he's going to be using. And I, I know by prophecy that the Lord has given to me personally is that he's in the business right now of unifying families. He's in the business right now of restoring things that were broken in the past. And that's going to be accomplished before the release. And that's something that I know for sure. And I, I mean, he's given this for the last two years to me again, that he is in the business of restoring families. He's un unifying some broken relationships. And after those things, it's almost like after that unifying happens, there will be a release. And I just feel that in my spirit. So I just wanted to just share that with you. Um, so it's it's coming. It's just he's doing he's doing some background work that we don't see. You know, so um, and he's doing that for a lot of families, too. There's a lot of families right now that I truly feel they're being unified there. They're, there's probably issues that has come up and spurred up that had looked like it was like never going to be mended. But he is in the mending business. So he is unifying because there's a, a huge uh, relatable reason for the unity. The unification has to happen. So he's in the business of restoring marriages. He's in the business of restoring children to their parents. He's in the business of restoring right now a lot of things in families. Um, and those things don't come easy. It's a lot of letting go. It's a lot of forgiveness, a lot of um, releasing of hurts, a lot of digging inside. So um, it's a process that we just have to go through it. And But he is still working in the background. So it's just something I just wanted to encourage everyone, really, whoever, whoever this applies to is just really, that's what the God is doing something in the background. <laughs> I receive every single word of that, every single word, and it is worth it. it I, I, I told a guy that today at work. Um, true humility is when you can sit and say, if my entire life was to affect one soul 
and that soul be saved, it was worth it. That's humility. You know, it's not about numbers. If your life on this earth can cause one person's soul to be saved, it was worth it. It was worth it. So in this um, season that I am, uh, I am in in this wilderness, if one soul be saved, if one heart be pierced and open to the acceptance of Christ, and it was every day of this house arrest, every day that was spent in jail, every day was worth it to me. Because I know where eternity, eternity is going to be. So, anybody yeah, else? I'll tell you right now, yeah. I don't think you have to worry about that. I guarantee you, you've saved a lot of souls. I guarantee you. What? I guarantee you. Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. You helped. Yeah. You helped. You guided other souls. <laughs> I'm telling you. I, I yeah. guarantee you. I'm you, a willing vessel. All right. Hey, All right, Shannon, everybody. Shannon, at the beginning yes, of this, uh, I don't know if uh, you're going through this because, you know, you just didn't d do a good PMCS on your uh, on your situation, and therefore you didn't get a proper warno. And I, I, hope the sit, I hope the sit rep for you right now is good, but I, I know in the end you're going to have a good AAR. Yeah. So that's all I got to say. Yeah. Hey, I, I understood every word of that. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right, anybody else? If not, I'm going to pray us out, and uh, we'll meet for the last time of 2023 next Tuesday, and that'll be the transition. All right, so we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for yet another lesson tonight where everybody listened to your spirit and spoke words that you've given to speak. Lord, we ask you, Lord, going into next week, Father, going into next Tuesday, our last study of this year, we ask for new beginnings. We ask for the old to be left behind. Anything of us out of this year, Father, that you don't want to progress into the next year, we ask you to separate us from it. We ask that your Holy Spirit magnify, fill us to the point of overflow, that we go out and we are that light. That we don't hold all this joy in our heart. We don't hold these testimonies that you provided for us to speak. We don't hold them. That we speak to others' testimony, to the testing of the faith, to the trials and tribulations. This is gifts that you give us to give to others, and we won't hold them, Lord. Lord, we won't be shamed to say your name. We won't be shamed to tell our testimony. We won't be shamed coming into this tomorrow, not even the new year, to tomorrow, doing our self-evaluation, producing fruits, Lord Jesus, of your spirit, being humble and servants, vessels for your spirit to work through us. We pray right now for anyone that is on their knees, anyone that calls upon your name, that you stretch out your hand over them in protection. Comfort them. Let them feel your love. Fill their heart with your love, your unconditional love. Because your unconditional love changes people. Let change be in the hearts of everyone, everyone, because we all need it, Lord. As you sanctify us through our life and prepare us for you. Use us as you see fit. Separate us from our own wants. Separate us from our own will. Let us live according to your will and your calling upon our life. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I love you all. And we shall see y'all next Tuesday. Happy Jesus Day until then. Merry Christmas.